prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because it is divided forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Luther says when you look at the cross, it is absolutely the case that the cross is the greatest manifestation, the clearest in a sense manifestation, of who God is, because we see God on the, on the cross in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. We see, we see Jesus Christ uh, bearing the sin of the world, and God's justice is fully satisfied, and he's also justifying at the same time. In a sense, both of the truths of Exodus 34 are on full display in the cross of Christ. It, 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 it makes sense of something that is, is revealed in the Old Testament, but can't be understood fully apart from the revelation of the cross. So because for Luther, the cross is this defining revelation of who God is, he said that needs to change our whole understanding of how we approach God, that needs to change our whole understanding of of, uh, of, of our own sin, and it actually also needs to change our whole understanding of what glory looks like with respect to suffering. Look at number 21. A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. Why? Because a theologian of glory looks at the cross and says it's a defeat. It's this great uh, defeat for, for God. It's, it's inexplicable. And yet, a theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. The theologian of the cross knows that it's in the, in the revelation of Jesus Christ on the cross that we fully begin to understand who God is and His righteousness. That wisdom which sees the invisible things of God and works as perceived by man is completely puffed up, blinded, and hardened. The law brings the wrath that brings the wrath of God, kills, reviles, accuses, judges, and condemns everything that is not in Christ. Yet that wisdom is not of itself evil, nor is the law to be evaded. But without the theology of the cross, man misuses the best in the worst manner. So what, what Luther is going to then say is this. The cross of Christ, because it is the ultimate revelation of who God is, needs to be at the center of our thinking. And if it's at the center of our thinking, we see the seriousness of sin, we see our own natural inability to perceive things correctly, and we also begin to understand um, who, how, how God wants us to approach Him. In other words, the proper posture that we need as theologians to, uh, to understand and, uh, and begin to, to sort of do theology. So, what that's going to mean then is it's going to really uh, turn on its head the way that the church of Luther's day was understanding itself. They were, in Luther's estimation, they were primarily theologians of glory. They were concerned with, with building up the church in, in, in kind of visible ways. And Luther said, that that's, that's not how God has revealed himself. God has revealed himself not through these glorious and visible things, which actually are apt to mislead us, but God has revealed himself in the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so therefore, as theologians, we need to understand our own lives in terms of this suffering and in terms of this revelation. Now, what this is going to mean, really, is that the Heidelberg Disputation no, number one, compared with the 95 Theses, last night I said this, the 95 Theses, if you read them, there, there's really not, nothing that's Protestant about them, at least nothing recognizably Protestant from our perspective today. I believe through talks about repentance, and, and, he, and he certainly has this pastoral concern for his people uh, that, that hopefully Protestantism shares, but, 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 but the theology behind them really is, is 
more or less fitting with the, the, the late medieval Roman Catholic theology of Luther's day. But the Heidelberg Disputation really does take a step forward. It's, um, it, it, he doesn't directly attack the, the, the Pope or anything here, but, but he, he is beginning to attack the way in which theology is done and the way in which the church is presented. And, and he's also sort of recentering theology and saying our theology needs to be centered on the starting point needs to be the revelation of God in Jesus Christ on the cross. And, and, and then you'll see this as well in, in, in number 26, or number 25 and 26. He is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. The law says do this, but it's never done. So the law just increases our distance. Uh, but grace says, believe in this. It's already been done. Actually, one should call the work of Christ an acting work, and our work an accomplished work, and thus an accomplished work pleasing to God by the grace of the acting work. The love of God, and this is just a beautiful statement of Luther's theology, and in fact, I think of the core of Protestant theology as it develops under Luther. The love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. What Luther is saying is this, that our love and God's love is qualitatively different. Our love is, in a sense, uh, created because we see something lovely. Uh, because, because we see a, a, a person or a thing that evokes a sense of love in us. God's love is not like that, Luther says. God's love exists apart from anything lovely in us. And God's love bestowed upon us is actually what creates the loveliness in us. So the love of God is a creating love. It's not a reactive love. The love of God is generative, making something new in us, not responding to something in us. And here we, I think, can see both in terms of method, in terms of understanding of salvation, these things that we hold so dear in Protestantism. We talk about grace alone. And what does Luther say in 26? Grace says, believe in this, it has already been done. We talk about faith alone. And what does Luther say in 25? He who's not righteous who does much, but who believes much in Christ. We talk about that this is in Christ alone. And we see that the center of the Heidelberg Disputation is on the cross of Jesus Christ being the ultimate and final and fullest, in a sense, revelation in history of who God is. And then to the glory of God alone, well, 28, I think, encapsulates that. It is God's love, God's purposes, God's work which operates from beginning to end in us as human beings. After the Heidelberg Disputation, after Luther presents these theological theses, actually he didn't present them, he wrote them and had someone else present them for him. But, but after Luther puts these out there, um, in a sense, there's no going back. Um, while he's made to us not seem like radical statements, and again, he doesn't directly take shots at any particular people. He doesn't name names here. But by the time we get to 1519, it's clear that this kind of theology, this cross-centered, grace-centered, faith-centered, God's glory-centered kind of theology, a theology of the cross, Luther would say, it can't coexist with the, the church of his day. They realize it, and increasingly he begins to realize it. And so what you see within about a year of this is that uh, the, the, the church begins to write things that directly attack Luther. 
And Luther, because of his personality, just keeps answering back. And, and they just keep ratcheting up uh, the volume against each other uh, until they reach a point of no return. But, but for Luther, it's not just because he was a sort of aggressive and cantankerous person. It was because by this point, this had gripped him. By Luther's own account, his personal conversion comes shortly after this, actually. And it's hard to know whenever you read accounts that people have of things that happened 20, 30 years before. Uh, you know, it's hard to know how how accurate they are in every particular. So, and, and, then, and then especially when we're talking about something like conversion, which is a work of God, and Luther says it's a work of God here, it's even harder to know exactly, exactly when that point took place. But, but the way Luther describes it, at least, it was shortly after this, and what he began to realize is something that I think you find fairly clearly played out here, which is the righteousness of God isn't something that, that pulls us away from him. But actually, the righteousness of God, as it's revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ, Romans 3, um, is, is in fact the good news that enables us to have a, a right relationship with God and hope of eternal life and the promise of forgiveness of sins. Let me leave it there for now. We'll take a 30-minute break. Um, please uh, uh, spend some time in the fellowship hall. We've got snacks, coffee, water.